morning. All right, we'll get this thing started. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Good morning. My name is Matt Knudsen. I'm the geospatial librarian at the New York Public Library over on 5th and 42nd. And I'm Dave Rudin. I am the product manager for NYPL Labs over at the New York Public Library for a couple more days. Uh, but this project is something I'm going to still be continuing to work on. And we work here. Uh, you probably colloquially know it more as here. Sometimes we frequently refer to it as the Ghostbusters building. And I more specifically work right there, which can also be known as this place, which is the Lionel Pincus and Princess Fierrell Map Division. You should come visit Open Invitation, Room 117, 5th and 42nd, Spectacular Map Collection. We have about 433,000 sheet maps, about 20,000 books and atlases, 33,000 scanned maps to date. Uh, collection ranges from the global to the local scales, from the antiquarian to the contemporary. We have about 200,000 plus topographic maps from around the world, historical, contemporary, and we have a bunch of property maps at the building level, at the street level, tens of thousands of sheets, many of them representing New York City across time. And for those maps that we scan, we apply this very happy symbol. Um, many of these currently can be downloaded at maps.nypl.org um, in high resolution, unencumbered. The rest of the 13,000 are coming soon. So we serve many different kinds of users across many different kinds of domains. I will not read that list. And I work here. Uh, it's an area called South Court. It used to be the outside. It used to actually be the courtyard of the library, but when we started running out of space, we built a building inside the outside of the building, which is kind of a metaphor for what we do. But when you look down from our desks, you see this. Now, the brown stones you see down there are the, actually the foundation of the library. And these were taken from the Croton Distributing Reservoir, which used to sit on the side of the library. This is a shot from 1879. In the backyard of the reservoir was once a crystal palace. It was the second World's Fair site built in 1853, and it burned down in 1858, unfortunately. The real estate powers reinvented the space, and they called it Reservoir Square. And then in 1911, the New York Public Library was built, and this is a shot from 1931. And you can see its first instantiation on a fire insurance map, just called the Public Library. And that brings us to today. But back when the library first opened in 1911, this place was a monument to every single information revolution that preceded it. This thing was, in fact, a giant steampunk database. <laughs> the building is actually built around the concept of information retrieval. And it was the most cutting edge technology of the time. Pneumatic tubes were used to send messages. And systems of pulleys and levers were used to bring books up from the stacks. We had workers that would physically run and fetch books. It basically sounds like a modern database. But indexing took longer. Human parallel computing. Uh, and that brings us to today. We see very little difference between the stacks of books that we have and racks of servers. That the information that's contained in these physical materials can and should be just as accessible as digital materials are today, to enable us to see our past through the tools that we use to explore the world today. But we're not here to talk about our backyard. Let's talk about the site that we're on right now. So, and more specifically, we're gonna talk a little bit about what happens when you mine information from historical maps, and you start to connect it to other information that refers to those places, all throughout the universe of information, all these universes of information. And then you iterate that across time. Oops. Nope, you, you totally missed I that. have more stuff on this slide. OK. <laughs> so this very site was first occupied by a European. And that European was a guy named Wouter van Twiller. And he was the fifth governor of New Netherlands. And he occupied this site in the 1630s. By, this, by 1638, the English were starting to encroach on New Netherlands, and in, uh, evidence of that was Virginia sent two colonists up to occupy Fort Nassau, which was at the mouth of the Delaware River. Okay, they got caught really quickly, they got brought back, and they worked on the farm of Van Twiller, right here, on this site. They were the first two English settlers on Manhattan Island. 
They were tobacco farmers and they soon went out of business, unfortunately, but you can see all kinds of information in the Stokes iconography of Manhattan and elsewhere, all throughout the web. By the 18th century, this place comes to be owned by a guy named Francis Bayard Winthrop. Okay, so Winthrop is the great, great, great grandfather of the former governor of New Jersey. He's also the great, great, great grand uncle of John Kerry, which is pretty amazing, sitting in this room too. We've got Winthrop's papers at the New York Public Library in our archival portal, and all of the conveyance information about this land and how it was transferred and all of that stuff, who he transferred it to. And then we can find all kinds of other information in the census records of 1790, 1800 to see who his family was like, did he own slaves? All of these things uh, can be attested to all throughout this universe of information. Okay, so by the middle of the 19th century, the meatpacking district was really, really concentrated over on the Hudson River, but had started to move over to the East River. This place was going, undergoing a radical transformation. So the first image you see on the top is of this place called Turtle Bay, and this is the Turtle Bay farm outlined in the big purple outline. Turtle Bay was being filled in by the middle of the 19th century. The meatpacking houses were coming out. You can see an offal contractor's yard. Nice job, right? <laughs> Wheeling and dealing and guts and brains. Um, and then you can see also breweries moving into town. This is the Turtle Bay Brewery as of 1850, and all the different instantiations of the Turtle Bay Brewery as it existed from one period of time to the next, to the next, to the next in this very spot. The meatpacking industry solidified here into, uh, congealed here on this neighborhood, <laughs> so, um, into a couple of really, really big prominent players. And these were n big national players in meatpacking and distributing Schwarzschild and Schultz Salzburg and United Dress Beef here. Uh, you can see them represented all throughout all kinds of great documents. This is an ad that I found on Google Books of these two guys, one on top of the other in the same geographic order. You can see they had places all over the United States. They were distributing all over. They were huge. So huge um, that we can find information where they are being investigated with all the well-known companies like Armour and Swift and all of these other places in Chicago. Uh, they were being investigated uh, for antitrust activities um, under the Sherman Act. They were price-fixing beef. Uh, this is 1895. And then, um, and then a little bit later in 1912, they were price-fixing butter. Okay, so these were monopolies, huge monopolies. And then another really interesting attestation to this particular place and these people operating this company is a little bit of PR here. So this is 1906, um, just after Upton Sinclair writes and releases The Jungle. I um, mean, you can see this is signed by all of the big meatpacking companies, a special invitation. Come and see our meatpacking houses. We've always had an open door policy. It's awesome here. So you can see, doing PR, you can see that playing out in the papers of the day, which is really fantastic. And it's all tied together through these geographic locations and these names that are on maps. So by the 20th century, early 20th century, we can see some really interesting stuff happening. Meat packing district was sort of going down. The city was in decline in certain parts. This is the Great Depression. The New York Public Library contracted a photographer to go document New York City as it was changing. And so these are evidence photography of this very neighborhood, 46th Street, 45th Street. This is between First Avenue and the East River, um, as well as 42nd Street. Um, here we go. By the mid-20th century, the, the UN had been built, and we have a bunch of wonderful documentation of that too, in photographs and otherwise. You can see that nice panoramic view. And then the Sputnik, the model of Sputnik, which maybe you all saw during your registration, this is a shot from 1959, visitors visiting the UN and seeing the Sputnik for the first time. And then we see Nyerere, who was the first uh, prime minister and then president of uh, Tanganyika and then Tanzania. Of course, the same thing. So we've lured you here with the promise of talking about a space-time directory. And you're probably wondering what on earth it is. Uh, there's a lot of it coming together right now, and we can't give you any exact, concrete uh, mock-ups of what the UI of this is going to look like, but we imagine it will likely look something like this. <laughs> but moreover, what we're going to talk about today is kind of the, a tour of the different types of data that we have at the library, that libraries, that archives, that museums, that historical societies have, that when put together, 
remarkably resemble contemporary geodata that will allow us to actively connect the past to the present through geography, not just through lat lawns, but through colloquial place names. Because all of those documents that you just saw didn't have addresses, and the ones that did, those addresses aren't really there so much anymore. We want ways so that we can take the material of the past and bring it ambiently into the world that we explore today and offer this in any kind of fashion that people can work with because it'll be built on top of every kind of open interoperable, well, not every kind, but the standard interoperable geodata standards that we use today. People have been putting pictures on maps for a while, uh, and one of the best examples of this, Dan Vanderkam, who's sitting here, uh, released a couple of days ago, takes those 80,000 or so Street View photos and geocodes them for the first time making the library's collection incredibly accessible. But if you zoom in here to Stuyvesant Stuy Town, you see there's a lot of area where there aren't photos. Almost every single one of those areas has four to five photos for each dot. Stuyvesant Town has nothing in there. And that's not because there wasn't activity there. It's not because there wasn't activity being actively documented. It wasn't because there wasn't a vibrant life. It's because we don't have identifiers. We don't have identifiers to tie today's contemporary geography to that place. And the moment that contemporary geography changes, it breaks our link with the past. We're going to try to fix that, at least for New York, but in a way that's replicable to other cities. Because if you start with these property atlases, these property atlases that we have for almost every major city, at least in North America and certain parts of Europe, uh, there's a lot of information contained in them. So what do we do with the library? We take pictures of them, and we put those pictures on the internet, like we do with our other collections material. If you go here to digitalcollections.nypl.org, you can work with the million or so things that we've digitized out of the library's aggregate collections. But these are maps. There's so much more that we want to do with them. So we rubber sheet them. We get them at the right place in the earth. And from there, we do that enough. We do that a lot. You start to be able to get pretty comprehensive vector or raster layers that you can use and export into tons of different contexts. It's not just about the pretty pictures. It's about the data. And the extraction of that data is incredibly, incredibly important and incredibly valuable for research. So what you're looking at here um, is a document of 1852 New York building footprints. And the minute we publish this, and I want to I just take a note uh, to mention one of my colleagues who's probably here in the audience today, Mishka Vance, was largely responsible for hand encoding about 66,000 and drawing about 66,000 building footprints um, and entering tons of uh, attributes and using, uh, relying on the, the good graces of student groups and volunteers to help us uh, build out this data set. Um, the minute we finished it, a scholar, not quite the minute, uh, the minute we finished this uh, data set, a scholar approached us who had been, uh, it's uh, Sonia Shaw, and she had been uh, transcribing this thing called the cholera record. So New York City had a couple of big cholera outbreaks, the biggest one in 1832, and this document, the cholera record, was a daily publication of uh, people who contracted cholera, people who died from cholera, and their street addresses. And one of the great things about this data set is it has tons of places, particularly around a cholera hotspot, that don't exist anymore and are named in different ways, both in terms of the streets and the building footprints. So she was able to build a time progression of the vector of cholera as it spread across New York City and killed about 4,000 people in 1832. Now this is material that's been available since 1832, but for the first time ever, she was able to press play on this cholera outbreak and contrasted it with the outbreak that happened about 10 months after the major earthquake in Haiti in Port-au-Prince in 2010? 2010. 2010. Uh, and from understanding these historical outbreaks and from taking historical materials but being able to analyze them with contemporary tools, she was able to bring entirely new insights to how cholera spreads and how we can prevent greater humanitarian disasters in the future. So old data is pretty useful. But if you're doing this by hand, it does not scale. It's a big bottleneck. So if we want to go from here, these atlases that contain these different kinds of information. <coughs> There's a lot to collect. But if you've worked with GeoJSON, if you've worked with shapefiles, you can join all of those attributes around the geometry itself. And so Mauricio Giraldo, who's here in the very back row hiding, hi Mauricio, who's the uh, interaction lead for our team, uh, spent a couple of weeks 
building a tool that, in effect, gets the vector data out using computer vision and a lot of other really critical attributes from these maps. We call it uh, the, the map vectorizer. But in taking this tremendous amount of work that used to have to be done by one person and then doing it by a computer, you've taken a mountain of work and still had a mountain of work. What we needed to do was break it up into bite-sized tasks. And so we launched the building inspector, which lets folks kill time and make history by helping us go to the past, understand the geography of New York City. So first we asked folks to help us just say, was the computer right or wrong? Does it need fixing? Is it a building? Yes, no, fix. And people started getting pretty addicted. Then we started asking them to do all kinds of other things, to fix the buildings that are fixed, to bring in those address data points, to classify the building use codes, and to capture place names that are recorded in the map. We've had 1.1 million contributions so far. We're looking forward to a lot more. And from that, we've been able to generate really effective outputs for representing historical New York from 1855 to 1862. And that's given us historical POIs, points of interest. The kind of thing that you can use to actually capture those addresses and outlines, that you can get the centroids, that you can do the kind of thing like point-based geocoding. And we've just begun capturing street center lines that are historically accurate as well. Think about tiger data or lion data here in New York and representing the start and end addresses. With that, we can start to put places that no longer exist back on the map, like Stuyvesant Town, even if we don't have precise attestations of what those addresses are, we can predict what they are, using a combination of where we got a specific match POI-based geocoding and where we need to interpolate center line geocoding. We've now started to get a geocoder for the past. We have that raw material. It's, we're just starting to put together the way to actively search that. But we want to go further. We want to talk about places the way that we talk about places, not just addresses. That's people. That's businesses. That's business types and use codes. And so that's all information that's contained in historical city directories which we have going all the way back to 17... 1786. These are like the, the yellow pages and the white pages, and they represent uh, millions, upwards of 13 million New Yorkers in business across uh, about 150 years of history. So what this gets us is not only people, but the change of people over time, the change of business over time. And as we're able to catalog and chronicle that and tie that to those places, suddenly we're able to talk about those places and understand the geography that it's tied to. And also surface this information in new and revolutionary ways to our library patrons, which is one of our big things because we're a library. Three minutes. Okay, we got a short amount of time. But this is the kind of thing that lets us actively start connecting things like city directories, newspapers, archives, photographs with our contemporary geography. And as you start to do this over and over again, we start to be able to get access to the atlases of the past, get access to the New York geography as it's changed. And not just think about geography, but think about place, think about search, think about the ability to actively tie information, historical newspaper stories, old restaurant menus into what these places are, the same way that we work with Yelp and Foursquare today. We get a change log for New York, but you've got to do it a lot. Oh, sorry. You've got to do it a lot. What we just talked about was the process for one year. And so to get it right, You've got to scale that, which means diffing from one year to the next. If you've got one year of the past, it's really easy to go forward or back, but getting there the first time is really challenging. What we've been doing for the past decade is getting to that point where we have enough data to start going forward and backward from about the mid-1850s, and now we're at that place. It's a process that's finally repeatable and scalable, but it's only possible with a community, with this community, and with a bit of computation along the way. You folks here in this room, you've built the tools and the technology that's made this possible, that's made this cheap, that makes this doable. This is something that was once only in the hands of gods, generals, and kings, and now we all have access to it for today. And now we can start to bring that to our past. And so, of course, this has to be open source. It's not just for New York. This can be for other cities, but it's going to require pretty big efforts and partnerships between cultural heritage institutions and public communities like us here. And the way to start with that, if you're interested outside of New York, is to get involved with the OHM community. We genuinely believe that public libraries can be public platforms for public works, for building things together, for convening. Not just for things about our past, but for today. And we think that this can be a flagship for what that gets to mean as we build information resources that genuinely should define what our 21st century should be. 
truly open, truly accessible for anyone and everyone, not just today, but our past and our future. So, there's a lot of folks that we want involved. If you're a citizen cartographer, we want you. If you have an idea about how we should be building this for both the historical dimensions and for the technical dimensions, we want you. If you've got data that you want to geocode for the past, yes, please, we want to talk to you. And if you want to build this, yes, please, come join us. Because we're hiring a space-time engineer. <laughs> if you've got any interest in that, come find us. Or tomorrow we'll be hosting a Birds of a Feather and Monday at the Hack Day. We will be there helping to facilitate an open uh, historical data track. And folks here from the library, please raise your hands. We've got Ben, Mauricio, uh, Matt, and myself. Come find us afterwards. We'd love to talk about this. Thank you all. We're so excited to be building this. We're so excited to be building this with you. Happy to take your questions. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we have an incredible, incredible captioning team here today who are providing live streaming captioning for all of these talks if you go online. So, yes, thank you for that, for both the, for the hearing impaired, for folks who can't hear us because we talk silly, silly fast. Like, this is amazing, so. Thanks. All right, questions? Where are you going? You hinted at. Ah. Where are you going? Oh, uh, I'm going to be going to uh, MapZen, where I'm going to be working on the geocoding team Just there, there. which is a really critical missing piece for this project. Uh, we haven't had an effective, really easy to drop in open source geocoder uh, that can work with the kind of data that we're starting to bring together. He's building historical geocoders at MapZen. Yeah, I'm building historical geocoders, I'm not just building geocoders. <laughs> yes? The mics are weird. Just shout for errors in your maps? If so many people are contributing, how do you know if the data is accurate? So the question was, how do we correct for errors in our maps? And the answer is that we are going to be debating that vigorously internally. Uh, there's a couple of, different, a couple of different theories on this. Uh, one is that what we want to do is get people to vote the same way that we do in Building Inspector, where tasks can be atomized, where things can get broken up. Consensus makes sense, a lot of sense. Uh, there's also a school of thought inside our team that we might want to go with the last edit wins along the lines of OSM. I don't know how this is ultimately going to play out. Uh, I do know it's going to be a very interesting thing and we're going, to, we're going to see where it goes. With Building Inspector though, these are all consensus edits and what it says is right almost always is right. Uh, and there's a thin amount of work after the fact to post-process the data once a layer has gone through Building Inspector to say, did we miss anything? Is there a really large building that the initial pass didn't pick up or something that got deleted? But that becomes incredibly trivial, especially compared to the scale of capturing 66,000 buildings. Uh, it's an afternoon's worth of work as opposed to a year. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, if you're uh, working at the DE layer, is not a big layer, if you're collecting data, uh, if you can map, can map like ADN and ADN and would be public looking at your tables and do our check on it. Yes. All, so, Sorry, sure, the question was, are we going to be publishing this data? Uh, are we going to be publishing the raster layers, the vector data? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, right now, if you want to, you can start using our historical, uh, our historical raster layers. But please don't. It's going to murder our tiny little file server. We're in the process right now of migrating all of that up into just like static S3 files so that anyone can use that and use our historical building footprint layers. If you want to reverse engineer the layers that are currently used in Building Inspector, please do that. Those work great. Uh, we're going to be publishing in the next couple of months easy ways to get access to that. And then all of that vector data that already exists is already downloadable. The stuff that's there in the map warper is really easy to get for... Uh, 1854, for the years that are in Building Inspector, we've got data that's getting congealed right now in consensus algorithms for Building Inspector that gets published as GeoJSON. But one of the first, one of the first things we're going to do as we build this space-time directory is to, is to publish a, a sort of more, co more coherent data catalog where each bibliographic object or each set of atlases and the data streams which come off of that are able, are, are downloadable and easy and many different kinds in open We formats. want you to be able to do this really, really soon. Uh, not just have it be something that's part of, you know, standard uh, layers that only we can use. This is hopefully one of the first steps that we're going to be taking in the next couple of weeks. There's or a question months. back here. Or, hold on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, are you going to be publishing a recipe book or a 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So one of the one of the. Yes, yes. So, so one of our slides said, do this for your city. And we think that the, one of the strong values, of course, of both open source philosophy and software development, data production and data publishing is that uh, it's usable, it's replicable, and we're going to document the heck out of this thing so that other people can spin their own versions of this up. So part of the reason that, and I, sorry I didn't mention this earlier. So we got a bunch of funding from the Knight Foundation to do this. We, uh, we were winners of the last Night News Challenge for libraries. And the reason that they got excited about this was that this is something that doesn't just make sense for New York City, it makes sense for every city that has a large historical map collection. And it doesn't matter where it's held, as long as it's been digitized and there's a community that is willing to put together the pieces. All of the components for this are open source, and we want to make sure that it's replicable, easy to spin up open source, the kind of thing that ultimately it should be possible in the next couple of years to have really easily be containerized and drop the different things in, but also the end-to-end -end process is meticulously documented. Uh, so that's definitely where we are going with making this happen. It only really makes sense if it's truly federated so that we can start to feed this all into bigger, broader, more collective efforts. I saw a hand over here. So, yes, we've started doing a bit of that. Um, one of the things, sure, the question was, have we started trying to extract spatial data and relationships from text? Uh, yes, we have. We've done some things, particularly with those city directories, to once you connect an address to a geometry, to start looking at the changes that have happened at that address over time. So Andrew Hill, who's at CarterDB, came to our first map hack a couple of uh, years ago and built a tool that was able to actually find people who moved, people who had the same profession but addresses changed, or lived in the same place and professions changed over a couple of different year time spans. And he started drilling into the stories of some of them. And the one who we really kind of zeroed in on was the guy who was once a clockmaker but then became the actual handset designer for Alexander Graham Bell's first telephone. And because of the renown he gained from that, he was able to afford to move his studio further downtown and then get a home outside of the studio in Brooklyn. So, this is not at all different from today. Yes, Ben. I just want to say hi to Ben and what's still alive. Uh, uh, just want to say, I know we're out of time. We're we are going to put up a bird with feather session tomorrow morning. Uh, there's boards out there, so keep an eye for that. We'd love to talk to you, hear more of your questions, understand, help us understand better how we can, how we can do this. Thanks.